lecture eight. Uh, thanks for joining me again. I'm, I'm trying to get caught back up on a class. I find, I'm sure you guys are finding the same thing. It's a little harder to be disciplined when it's uh, do this online when you can find time and uh, um, versus you got a class to meet at a specific appointed time and date. Uh, appreciate what you're all going through with um, and, and trying to get this done. So, so today um, I'm going to talk about ceramic and glass, ceramics and glasses. And um, I almost didn't put this lecture in the in the group, and then I, I kind of recognized um, also some of the comments on the boards recognized uh, what great demonstrations there are, and how this really is very essential content, and it's really actually great stuff that you can even bring into the the, the classrooms through demonstrations. Um, you can motivate science and, and and teach science from this also. So this is lecture eight. Um, let me start with a little bit of uh, business in this in this whole thing. Um, First of all, um, in terms of the date, I need to wrap things up by March 19th is a Friday, and that's the date that is our Friday of exam week, and uh, through that weekend I should get everything uh, put together and submitted. Um, if Talk to me if you have any trouble, email, privately, whatever. Um, I want to make sure everybody gets a, a satisfactory grade uh, from this, and I, you know, it may require doing a little work. But um, and again, I'm very lenient. I understand everybody's in a very different situation as to how they're using this content, and um, and, and it's a little hard to do something that's one size fits all. But uh, to the extent uh, um, I can show you're, you're you're doing something with this, I'm I'm happy to give credit. Um, there'll be at least two more lectures after this one. Um, I think I will probably talk about polymers. I've actually at least three topics I'd like to talk about: polymers, uh, sustainability, and probably putting this together with respect to automotive design, which is uh, something that's a little bit near and dear to my heart, and it's also something that I think can translate well into the K-12 classroom. Um, last business topic: with respect to projects, projects are nominally 25 points each. The ideal project is for somebody to say, hey, I've done something with material science in my class. This is what I've done. Show me the, the write-up. Show me some examples of what students have done. Give me some reflections on what worked. That's worth 25 points. If you're not in a position to do that, and I know many people are not quite in a position to do that, um, let me know. We'll work something up. We, we want to do some sort of a project, and it can be more than one project. Um, uh, but what I want is if somebody's going to get an A, I would like um, you know, pretty good project work, and then also pretty good um, working on the on the class material. Show that you've you've done what you can with that. And again, um, I recognize some people come from very very technical backgrounds; others do not. And uh, if if you're not, I don't want to uh, to, to use that uh, against you. Um, so, um, and, and, you know, the way we are in engineering teaching, we, <laughs> I, I recognize that the way, the way I have been taught for a long time in engineer, engineering school and teaching here, um, we, we tend to be a somewhat of a, a masochistic group, not by, uh, not, not by will, but it's, we, we do tend to demand a lot of technical, uh, prowess often, but that's not, not necessarily what we have to look for here. It's a different, different uh, situation. Okay, uh, enough of the business. Let me get into uh, the contents of this lecture. What we're going to talk about is ceramics and um, ceramics and glasses, and two basic things I want you to recognize. F first of all, we'll use metals as a baseline. We want to consider how ceramics are different than metals, and a lot of this has to do with basically going back to bonding. And ionic crystals, uh, ionics are sort of where we get the basis. Most ceramics have strong ionic character. We can do a lot based on charge balance and so forth. Um, also, there can be some covalent character. And what this means is that generally you can't have these kind of bond switching that you see with dislocation motion before. Remember, you can see this dislocation moving through that will allow metals to change neighbors and they're very happy switching, swapping uh, neighboring atoms. Ceramics can't do that. You can't get that sliding of a dislocation on a slip plane and as a result of that what happens if you put too much force on something rather than the, the atoms rearranging a little bit causing plastic deformation they break. And um, we're not going to talk about this in this class but you can talk about how vac vacancies and impurity deep, impurities must satisfy charge balance 
If you're doing AP chemistry, there's some great solid state chemistry, and that you, you may well do this in, in uh, AP chemistry. It's also very relevant to ceramics. We're not going to talk about that here. What we will talk a little bit about is uh, because dislocations can't move, it's really not because there's so much few dislocations, but dislocations, they are immobile. basically immobile that that causes the problems and then we also have high melting temperatures that gives you creep resistance we haven't really talked about creep basically means the materials will, will maintain strength at high temperature and then lastly we'll talk a little bit about how ceramics are used talk about some applications we'll actually talk a fair bit about how uh, glasses are are formed and used and again I think there's some awesome content that you could use there um, in a in a uh, classroom setting so um, first of all, what is a ceramic? Basic definition, it's a mixture of a metal or non-metal element and a non-metal or non-metallic elemental solid. So you've got one that is at least metal and one that is basically non-metal. So for example, so if you said, for example, uh, T-I-A-L is a compound, and it is a compound. Would that be a ceramic? Give you a second to think. That one is not, because they're both metal. Uh, pick up alumina, Al203. This is a metal, aluminum, and a non-metal, oxygen. So this one is a ceramic. Similarly, another very common one, silica, SiO2, would be a ceramic. Um, other common ceramic will be silicon carbide. Uh, question, would diamond be a ceramic? Uh, I would say largely it's, it's entirely covalently bonded. Silicon carbide is very, very covalent also, but uh, it doesn't really pass this definition quite so well, but it's, it's really all just one um, non-metallic solid so uh, kind of fits basically the the, the, de the definition okay so that's how that's our basic definition of a ceramic they are compounds is really and they include They're compounds that include non-metals if it's something like copper aluminum or iron aluminum those are things we call Intermetallics, if they're all if they're all metal. So one of the things that we talk about ceramics, some are are, are many are ionic. There's also some covalent character in there, and the percent ionic character increases with the difference in electronegativity, and um, so if you consider some of the lowest electronegativity values on the chart over here versus some of the highest here. Um, cesium fluoride, for example, would be something that would be highly, highly ionic. Uh, something that wouldn't be nearly so ionic was what I mentioned before, silicon carbide, for example, or um, uh, the, the, and, and compounds like that. But again, there's, a, there's even with silicon carbide a substantial um, ionic character with it. That's almost always what you end up seeing with ceramics, is you end up seeing um, highly ionic ceramics such as calcium fluoride or somewhat uh, non, um, somewhat covalent uh, like silicon carbide. Both cases, it's hard to move dislocations through. As a result, you can't get the kind of shape change. You can't get plastic deformation very easily. And that gives you very different response, i.e can't deform them plastically, you can't bend them, they end up breaking, and that comes back to the bonding. Um, again, making the link to chemistry, um, we could look at different bond types that are basically what you study in chemistry in depth. You've got your ionics, your covalence, metallics, and your secondary, and um, what, the way we teach this in material science and chemistry, we often do these, these plots of potential energy uh, versus interatomic distance. If you've got A and B, you can imagine that as they approach each other, they might join 
and reduce the potential energy of the pair. If something has a big change in energy, as B approaches A, you end up getting um, a, usually a lot of heat given off when that compound is made, and then you also have a fairly large melting temperature. And uh, you can see bond energies here for ionic covalent metallics. Most of these are quite high. If you look at the lowest one of the group, uh, that would be mercury. Mercury, we know, is liquid at room temperature. It doesn't have a very large bond energy. If we look at some of the biggest on here, tungsten has a very high bond energy. We know tungsten is what we make light bulbs out of. It has a very, very high melting temperature. Um, and if we you know, look, and think, look at things like aluminum and iron in the middle, and they, they scale as your bond energy goes up, your melting temperature also goes up. Covalence can have similar similar orders of magnitude, actually it's often greater than those for uh, uh, metallics. And uh, as a result, you see very high melting temperatures. Ionics also, you can see very high bond energies, very high melting temperatures. Fairly hard to melt table salt. You've got to get it pretty hot, but you can do it. And there are places that we do use molten salts and processing. Secondary bonding, all you chemistry teachers know, is a pretty weak form of bonding. And uh, the hydrogen bonds and Van der Waals bonds uh, are responsible for melting of ice at zero degrees C. Um, it's also responsible for holding polymer chains together. Those also tend to melt around, uh, you know, around boiling point of water or such. And uh, you know, really low things like argon, you've got to get really cold in order to make a uh, to make a solid out of. Okay, so summary so far. Ceramics are largely based on ionic bonding. They can have some covalent character. These bonds are very strong. They tend to be very pairwise, meaning it's hard to cut them with a dislocation. And they tend to be very, very directional. And from that bonding, we can understand the properties of ceramics to a pretty good degree. The other thing that you've already learned is about phase diagrams. Phase diagrams can apply to ceramics as well, whereas before you used to have comp elements A, B. Now you can have compounds like magnesia and alumina, and you can end up with um, complex phases. This is, this is a phase, single phase that takes on the structure. This is something called mullite, that composition. Um, I have to double check that. That's either mullite or spinel. I don't know my. <laughs> I should know that. I should know my ceramics. But that is a that's a single phase that has a a name. I'm pretty sure that one is uh, spinel. Mullite. I'm pretty sure silica alumina. Um, and uh, same same exact sort of thing applies. Before we really just looked at uh, simple eutectics. This is eutectic with another. Um, uh, with another transformation point in here. Uh, don't, don't worry about that, but basically the same thing applies. You have two phase regions, you have single phase regions, and within these two phase regions, you can always apply your phase rule, and from this you can tell how many phases are present, what the composition of each phase is. At this temperature, you'd have magnesia with that composition, spinel with that composition. You can also tell how much there is and we've gone through all that. All that works with ceramics. So once you know phase diagrams, you know it. Um, so anyway, same rules end up applying. And again, you can see this is a fairly garden variety system and uh, melting temperatures are pretty high, way above iron, way above titanium. So these crucibles are indeed the things that we use to melt things like metals in. So uh, very, very useful sorts of uh, sorts of things. So um, so ceramic structures are, are quite a bit more complex than uh, metal structures. Basically what you end up doing is, is make a structure based on uh, FCC, HCP um, packing of the anions. They make up the base structure. Cations go into the interstitial sites. Then you can worry about some rules on, based on the sizes and um, how, how the charge is balanced because sometimes you could have 
uh, anions that are uh, minus or two minus or three minus. And again, cations could be single plus or double plus or triple plus or so forth, and that all gets into the complexity. And we aren't going to go into that uh, in any depth, but that does tell you why, and you have these, this, this huge uh, diversity of structures that you can that you can have with ceramics, and it's based on um, basically the size ratios and the charge ratios tell you, uh, you can make a pretty good guess anyway, of what kind of structure you're going to have. Um, again, this is content that comes largely from our, uh, what we call our 205 class, which is for all the engineers. I don't uh, want to go through this in any depth, but what I do want to say is just harken back to things we've already learned. We learned elastic modulus has to do with how stiff something is. Elastic stiffness is, is the, the, the stress-strain relationship when everything is reversible. You can measure that. Best way to do that is with a three-point bend test like this. And that's something you could in principle even do in a, in a high school classroom. And then what's going to happen if you, you can bend it and it's not going to it's not going to take a permanent set. That's the nature of ceramics. Dislocations don't move. It'll just uh, respond elastically. But if you take it too far, it'll break. And if it breaks, you can you can measure the strength. And basically by finding the force and the the size of this thing, the lengths and the thickness and so forth, you can also figure out when something, uh, you can also measure the strength of it if you measure the, the force and know the sample dimensions of it. And um, basically the failure strength of ceramics, there's some typical values here and, and really the ranges are even larger than this. And the ranges for the fracture strengths really have to do with the flaw size you have in the material. And the key to making a good ceramic is having very small cracks in it or no cracks or no flaws at all. And to take some of these materials that usually you end up getting as powders and trying to turn them into homogeneous materials takes a lot, takes a lot of uh, a lot of temperature and often a lot of pressure to do that. And that's the way we end up doing that. So strength um, uh, can be measured. We optimize strength by reducing flaw size. So if you go and you just keep increasing the force, what you end up seeing is this is force versus displacement. Displacement's this thing here. You end up going along, force and displacement go up. This is related to the modulus. The, the stiffer the material is, the steeper the slope is. And eventually it just cracks. And you've probably all done that with something like a microscope slide. And that actually wouldn't be a, a, a terrible demo for something like this. You could just uh, break, break slides. Um, Okay, so how is a ceramic different than a glass? So let's talk about that a little bit. This says there is a subclass of ceramics. That subclass we call glasses. And glasses are often found themselves um, just as window glass or as, a, or as a separate phase between ceramic particles. So the primary definition here is glass is amorphous. And let me tell you what that means. So amorphous means that there is no long-range crystalline order. Most of the materials, all the metals that we, we saw, had form crystals. If you take pure silica, it will like to form a crystalline array like this also and join up and make and, and pack into these uh, crystalline phases. If, however, you put these impurities in, like sodium, let's make soda glass, magnesia, calcium, and there's also oxygen that goes with these, these interfere with the formation of the periodic structure. They end up breaking up this network by basically pulling additional oxygen, pulling um, not their, quite their share of oxygen to them. And uh, as a result of that, what you end up seeing is, is breaking up of these networks like this. And you see this structure, which doesn't have the regularity. If you compare these two, you've got very similar bond lengths, but you see, see some irregularity. This is not crystalline, won't diffract x-rays. Also, light can go through it in any direction. And that's amorphous. That's what we call glass. Glass means we don't have that long range order. We can have short range order, but not long. Okay. 
So basically, silica, silica SiO2 is the basis for quartz, and quartz really refers to a crystalline phase that looks like this. If you take silica, get it hot enough, up around 2,000 degrees centigrade, and cool it fairly rapidly, you'll still see something amorphous that looks like this, but you could cool it more slowly if you have some of these impurities in it and also capture this phase. If you cool silica really slowly and give it time to crystallize, it'll make something like that, and that's the glassy phase. I'm kind of throwing a little, quite of a bit at you, but um, those of you who have a chemistry background probably know you could go to the chemistry stores and buy a what would be called like a quartz glass crucible or quartz glass test tube, and that's a misnomer. What that means is it's fairly pure silica, not quartz in the crystalline phase, but has this amorphous structure associated with it, but not done by these alloy elements or these these uh, glass forming elements. Window glass, Coca-Cola bottles, things like that, we make that with silica. We add these glass forming um, oxides to it. We end up getting this structure and that's much, much easier to form. Okay. Okay, let's let's go on from there. Okay. So so let's imagine uh, for for the purpose of argument, we have silica, SiO2. Okay, what I could do is I could cool this at a moderate rate or I could cool it very slowly. If I cool this at a moderate rate, um, well, let's imagine if I cool it very slowly first. If I cool very slowly, what we typically see is you could plot specific volume as a function of temperature as I cool down, keep cooling down, oops, keep coming down along this line, and eventually I hit the melting point. What happens when I go from a liquid to a from a liquid to a solid? When we form a solid, we usually get a denser substance, so the volume would drop like that to a point like that, and then we'd also keep cooling along with the coefficient of thermal expansion. If I, and, and, and so so what what's happened from here to here is basically uh, if I go back a second, I've gone from this disordered phase this disordered structure, I should say, that has a fair bit of volume associated with it because of the disorder, to something that's much more ordered and therefore much more compact, and that ends up causing the volume to decrease, giving me this more compact structure. And that can happen all at that melting temperature. So the other thing that could happen is I could cool more quickly, and then I could have this disordered phase. All of a sudden, it can't it doesn't have the mobility to form a crystal because it's gotten cooled enough and this is what we call a super cooled liquid. It hasn't, basically we haven't given it enough time to form the, the crystalline structure. It stays here as a glass so it's got that disordered structure but it's now cold enough that those that those pieces can't move, up, move relative to one another like they might in a liquid. Um, so the difference is crystalline materials crystallize at a melting temperature, melting point, you have an abrupt change in specific volume at the melting point. That's what you see with crystalline materials. Glasses, on the other hand, don't crystallize. They keep this disordered structure. And the specific volume varies slowly with temperature. And then we have this glass transition temperature here where there's another change in slope. And at that point, the material really starts to harden up. So something that you may study, you may be able to study, is viscosity. Viscosity is this term eta. Eta is the relationship between shear stress and shear strain rate. And so this is if you have a piece of glass, you put a shear stress on it like this. How much stress does it take? How much force does it take to shear that material? If it's very viscous, it takes a lot of force. It's very difficult to, to shear that material. Whereas if you've got something like um, water, it shears very easily. And water is still a, a liquid and a, and a viscous liquid, so, so that's viscosity. And um, we'll say a little bit more about that, but not too much. So here's um, glass viscosity. 
versus temperature, various impurities. So this is fused silica. This is very high, basically pure silica. And here what I'm plotting is viscosity. Again, on our friend the logarithmic scale, you can see there's four orders of magnitude between each of these. So, so going, going basically at any point from two ends of that arrow, it's a factor of 10,000 that you're getting going from one to the other. So huge changes in viscosity are indicated by that. Okay. So this is fused silica. And let, let's pick a temperature here of, say, 1,200 degrees C, which is a pretty high temperature in any laboratory. It's a fairly high temperature to get at. Fused silica has a very high viscosity. If I put a little bit of impurity into this, you can see I reduce the viscosity by about a factor of 100. If I take and pay, make soda lime glass, which is what things like Coke bottles are made out of, you can see uh, the material is very soft at that point, very runny, and it's decreased by many orders of magnitude. In all cases, as I decrease temperature, you can see my viscosity goes up. So even for, for soda lime glass, by the time I'm down here to about 500 degrees C or below, the material is stiffened up quite a bit. A few silica is very, very, very stiff, and even my soda lime glass is pretty stiff. So that, that's how Coke bottles basically work, as you, as you put these other elements in there, other oxides, to break up those, those chains, and that gives you a material that's fairly easy to work. If you need more temperature resistance, as you often might, you basically make fused silica. And, um, and, and so, so again, by manipulating basically the structure through chemistry, we can change these properties and do things we're interested in. So fused silica, if you're doing semiconductor processing, um, fused silica is the go-to material because it's very low on impurities. You can heat things to very high temperatures, and this is really a key to making um, semiconductor crystals is having fused silica around so you can melt and process things with these very high temperature, this very high temperature, high purity glassware. Okay, so a fair bit of material here. Um, now, now I want to get to some things that are a little bit more fun that you really could use in your classroom. And this is about heat treating glasses. And um, annealing is something we can use to remove internal stresses caused by uh, uneven cooling. And if you go uh, to where anybody is working glass, uh, we'll go to a place like Glass Axis here in Columbus, Ohio, or any place where you've got studio artists working on glass, the last step they will typically do is temper their glass, uh, rather anneal their glass, so that it doesn't contain stresses and doesn't break on them uh, when, they're, when, when they're, they're moving it around. The other thing you can do is you can temper glass, and this is a little more difficult than, than annealing. So annealing removes internal stresses. Tempering, you put, to put uh, residual stresses into the glass. In particular, um, this makes it so it's much stronger effectively. Okay. So basically what you can do is, here's what, here's what you can do, is, is take a gob of glass that's very hot. While it's hot, you subject it to something like cold water, what happens is the surface cools first, it gets cold, it gets very hard, the hot, the, 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 the middle is still hot, okay? This has already gotten hard. Now when the center cools, it's going to contract in this way by thermal, thermal contraction, and as it contracts, it's going to drive this outside into a state of compression. So in the end, what you end up getting is a state of stress where you've got compression on the surface, tension in the middle, compression on the outside. And that way, if you have a little crack or try to form a little crack on the surface, it's in compression and it doesn't want to crack. Bad news is once things start to crack, you've got all this built up stress and the thing just goes, goes, uh, goes very violently once it all goes. And that can be good because it goes so violently it can turn things into very, very small particles. And those small particles can actually be less apt to cut you than one big knife-like uh, surface might be able to. So an annealed piece of glass, if you had taken an annealed piece of glass and cut it, probably would break fairly easily. It might break 
just into a few pieces, those pieces could be a real cutting hazard. Whereas if I take a tempered piece of glass now and I cause it to break, it's going to break into a whole bunch of tiny little pieces and you'll basically almost have nothing left. But each of these pieces on their own may not be so damaging. Okay. So this is great stuff to do in your classroom. So um, I've got two slides that, that have uh, some videos on that. And um, let me just go right to the Prince Rupert Drops video. And, uh, and I'll show you that one. And then I'll come back to this. We're going to end the show. Keep what we're doing here. Continue recording and go to my Firefox. Okay, here's um, Prince Rupert's drop video, and I'll, I'll go back to this corp. The corner. Prince Rupert's drop is a classic demonstration of the great strength of glass in compression. Here, a little bit of hot glass has been dribbled into a bucket of ice water, and it's cooling very, very quickly. As it cools, the surface of the Prince Rupert drop is in a compressed state. The core is in a state of great tension. The surface in compression is extremely strong and can't be broken with mechanical pressure. Whether it's squeezed with a pair of pliers or banged on with a hammer. If, however, the relatively fragile tail is broken, the surface tension is broken, and the Prince Rupert drop blows up into billions of tiny pieces. Okay, so that is, in my mind, pretty cool. Um, and so, uh, number one, Corning Museum of Glass. I worked for many uh, years as a glass designer. Corning Museum of Glass has some, some awesome uh, videos up, and I've put a link to their... Um, uh, page on there, their, their their channel, lots of lots of great stuff. If you can ever get to Corning, New York, I really recommend. It's one of my uh, favorite museums anywhere. It's got a great science section, also has a great art section. Um, more immediately right now, Prince Rupert drops. This is a demo you can do in your in your in your lab. If you just get some glass rod, you could even I think melt a Coke bottle to do this. Uh, but soda, soda lime glass rod would be great. You can get a uh, propane torch, or even better, is a map gas torch, which burns a little hotter. Get a gob on there. It takes a little bit of work to kind of hold the gob. Get the gob red hot. Let it drop into the water. Boom, you'll get the thing that looks like a tadpole. That is your Prince Rupert drop. You can make several of these. Be careful with them. Um, these actually store a huge amount of energy. You saw that one being uh, shattered underwater. If you uh, top, just just as you saw there, you could hit hit the ball of that with a hammer as hard as you like. You will not break it. But if you clip the end off, and usually you just do this with your hands wearing gloves, boom, the thing will turn into uh, a bunch of sand, literally no bigger than sand, right in front of you. And some of it will fly off with high velocity. I did this the last time I did this was in front of a classroom. I put it inside of a uh, like a five liter beaker, uh, figuring that would uh, shield anything. And uh, lo and behold, the piece of the Prince Rupert drop actually broke right through the beaker and still made it to the front row of my class. Um, nobody was hurt, no complaints filed. It was, it was uh, probably better than if uh, <laughs> better than otherwise. But uh, again, be careful with them. There's a lot of energy stored in that. It's a great demo, and it does. There is a lot of science in there. It involves solid mechanics, processing material, how glasses work. Uh, it's a great, a great demo. Um, another one that I'll show you. This is uh, from uh, Todd Bolenbaugh's um, Material Science Teacher Channel. This is uh, uh, one of the. Uh, I, I think this is uh, Tom Glasgow at um, uh, Tolls Academy, and. Uh, Again, showing tempered glass. Can't break it. Very hard to break. Can hit it fairly hard on the surface. And 
Maybe gloves. Maybe gloves. Maybe gloves. Maybe gloves. Yeah, safety is important with these things. It's so this is a piece of tempered glass, what you typically go buy. Doesn't go on the first hit. And there you go, just goes into little tiny itty bitty pieces. Each one can hurt you, but, but not nearly so badly. Thank you, darling. Is maybe a big, big, big piece. And you've probably all seen that sort of thing before. The bus stops, they always do that. We have a plastic bag for this, this is good. Okay, let's go back to our stuff. There's a uh, okay. So um, the we'll kind of go through the the links I put up there for you. We speak through them. So Prince Rupert drops. That's what I just showed you. That's a great one. Uh, this is one of the ones on tempered glass I just showed you. This is a guy who did something in his backyard, very similar, another great demonstration of it. The, the other thing that you will often find is in, a, in an automobile, you use this concept of tempered glass to get things to break into small shards and give you toughness. Then also you typically, so that people don't fly out of the vehicle, you'll do laminated glass where you might see uh, glass and then a polymer and then glass on the outside, and the polymer might be something um, might be something like polymethyl methacrylate, often called acrylic, or might be polycarbonate. And these aren't very scratch resistant, but they can be very transparent. The glass gives you very good scratch resistance. What the what the glass what the polymer in the middle does is make, makes it so if it breaks, it still hangs together. And you've probably all seen seen this, uh, where you might see a shattered uh, windshield. That's all in small pieces, but it still holds together. It's because there's a plastic layer in the middle that holds that together. And that's laminated glass, so they'll temper it and laminate it. Um, another good, really good channels that you might find useful stuff at Corning M Museum of Glass. Matt Sai teacher, uh, Todd Bolenbaugh's thing out of Tolls, and he's got uh, hundreds of demos from ASM camp there. Corning Museum of Glass also has awesome, awesome stuff. Um, where's my arrow gone? Um, again, here's more YouTube is about the same thing. It's some, some different Prince Rupert drops, tempered glass, laminated glass. And um, so I want to talk a little bit about how we, we, we uh, make things out of glass. Um, I think almost everybody that went through the... Uh, ASM camp got a Paris, what we call a Parison, made out of plastic. Uh, same basic approach is used with polymers and with with metal and with with glasses rather for making things like bottles. And this is the operation of pressing. So what you end up doing is this is a Parison mold. You take a gob of hot glass. This can also work with polymer, although you do it in an injection molding operation. Put some in there, press it in there, and this makes a Parison. And then what you can do is one of the great properties of glass is it behaves like well-masticated chewing gum. Um, and you can stretch it out and form shapes out of it, blow bubbles out of it. And so you can take that thing, expand it into a bottle mold and make like a jar or a Coke bottle or anything you like out of that. And this is basically the same way that you end up making plastic bottles as well. Um, the other thing, and this is again the great property of these viscous materials is you can take them and stretch them out and you can make fibers out of them, fiberglass, fiber optic cable, um, uh, all kinds of things are made this way. We can also do sheet forming, basically you take the molten glass, you can basically water cool some rollers, it'll suck it up like that, 
and then bring it right onto uh, uh, a, a cooling area, create a glass sheet, and you can, can control the cooling operation properly, and you can get tremendous strength out of it. You can also use chemical agents to put residual stress in the surface. And actually one of the hottest new structural materials, if you want to look on the internet and do more of this, something called a corning product called Gorilla Glass. And this is the glass that's on the front of your iPhone, which is pretty damage resistant, although there's plenty of people that can uh, attest that it's not, not absolutely uh, indestructible. Plenty of ways of still breaking it. Um, typically, the way we deal with ceramics, because they have such high melting temperatures, is we can't typically deal with them in the molten state. Instead, what we do is deal with them as powders. And so what we can do is do something called slip casting. A slip is basically uh, water plus ceramic particles. And there's usually some other little bits of things in there. And you might have to get the pH right and so forth. Basically, you pour that in there. You can do this into a plaster mold. The water gets sucked in to the plaster mold, gives you this coating there. You can trim that off, pull that out. And then you end up with this, basically, these ceramic particles that hang together. Then what you do is you take that and you fire it, which is basically put it in a kiln that gives heat it up, gives it strength. This is usually done somewhere on the order of maybe 1,100 degrees C thereabouts. And you end up with this complicated mess, which usually has glassy grain boundaries, things like silica particles, alumina particles. And that's basically the whole way you do ceramics. Uh, clay is very similar to all of this. It's, again, just basically ceramic particles that have some water in there. You can take that and form it pliably. You basically dry it out, get the water out, then you fire it. That's basically taking these particles and getting them to fuse together. And it's diffusion and reduction of surface energy that takes those particles and turns them into a single, single solid. Um, the other thing you can do is, is you can do powder pressing. This is the way we do most technical ceramics. Is we end up taking ceramic particles, press them into this pressed shape. This is what we call the green state. Let me write that so it can be red. The green state doesn't have anything to do with color, just means it hasn't been fired. And this is what happens when we fire or center this. The single particles together come together. They don't like having so much surface energy. The uh, chemical species diffuse around and basically form something like that, leaving some pores behind. And again, as I said at the beginning of this, the key to making a good ceramic is having a small pores, not too many of them, and a fairly uniform distribution of them. So um, lastly, I want to talk a little bit about the applications of ceramics. They, they, they actually um, don't get respect sometimes. They're used in things like pots and toilets and some really low-tech things, rocks and coffee mugs. They're also used in some very high-tech things. Um, so, again, as I mentioned before, I had spinel is a phase I talked about before. This is mullite, this silica alumina compound, um, very high melting, almost 2,000 degrees C. And these applica the applications, one of the highest tech applications are in thermal barrier coated turbine blades. This is what runs in the hot section of turbine engines like you use when you fly in airplanes. There's basically some gas. It runs on the inside of here. There's usually some little uh, cooling holes. You can see these cooling holes. A little bit of the gas comes through that. And the air on the outside is actually hot enough to melt the metal. But what we do is we put like the, the effect, the opposite of a winter coat on it. We put a, a coating on here that has fairly low thermal conductivity by design. And that keeps the inside cooler than the outside. And then, therefore, you can run this blade in an environment that would normally melt the metal and that's allowed us to increase the efficiency of jet aircraft quite a bit and that's been a significant success uh, by, by part of a lot of engineers um, over the years. 
Uh, wear resistance are another place you use ceramics. Um, in Columbus, Ohio here, we've, we've actually got a fair number of companies that work on uh, grinding and cutting tools based on uh, ceramics and diamonds. Uh, there's a company uh, that used to be called GE Super Abrasives uh, up in Worthington. Their claim to fame is they were the first group to commercialize uh, industrial diamonds. These diamonds go into things like dyes where we do wire drawing, where you need great wear resistance, also goes into cutting tools, and um, beverage cans, things like that. We often have to imprint uh, patterns and stuff for, the, for those little edges that you cut out when you bring the pull tab off. It's usually ceramic dyes that make, make those uh, uh, little perforations in there. So um, wear resistance is another great application of ceramics. won't say too much about it. The other thing is there's some great devices you can make. Um, this gets into functional ceramics. There's a class of materials called piezoelectrics. Basically what this means is if I put um, an electrical, actually I'll do it both ways, either way works, but I can put a strain on a material and that gives us basically a voltage out because we're basically moving the relative charges around within there. And we can use that to measure forces. The other thing we can do the other way is we can put an electrical potential in, get a strain out, so we can make actuators this way. And this is the way things like sonar, inkjet heads, uh, lots of small, precise displacements are done with these piezoelectric devices. Um, the spark that you use, like with a Zippo lighter, will often come from a piezoelectric, the uh, thing that turns your Weber grill on when you press the button. That's a, uh, coming from a piezoelectric as well. All kinds of ways you can use these uh, shape changes by current to, to do useful useful things in technology. Another application is sensors. We can make solid state electrolytes out of things like zirconia. Uh, Calcium doped zirconia allows us to diffuse oxygen very easily through zirconia, although we don't bring electrons through very easily. And that allows us to make oxygen sensors out of these materials. Again, uh, we're using functional properties. And again, going back to the whole idea of material science is with these functional materials that, that we don't have enough time to do any justice at all to, the same basic idea applies where we can change the process, that changes the structure of the materials, and that can give us good properties for sensing or motion application or all kinds of things. And that, again, is the heart of material science. So it doesn't just need to be applied to um, mechanical things, but there are other things as well. Okay, I think that wraps it up. Um, and here, here's the summary. Ceramic materials have ionic and usually mostly covalent character. Room temperature is behavior is really elastic, brittle fracture, elevated temperature, they're very strong. Heat treating of glass, the stresses that we can hold in glass are really important. Talked about some fabrication techniques, glass forming, slip casting, sintering. And then we can use uh, some of these unique electronic and functional properties, high hardness and high melting temperature to solve technical problems with ceramics. Um, that's it. Uh, Round in the bend, coming to home. We'll all must be done with this soon. Hope you're getting some something out of it, and um, look forward to uh, further comments and so forth. Take care. Bye.